All right. Well, welcome everyone joining us for this 12 noon, at least on the uh, in California, it's 12 noon. It might be one o'clock, two o'clock or 3 p.m., depending on where you're joining us today. But we're so glad to have you be a part of this. Uh, now, um, we have a tradition at Stormwater Awareness Week where um, we try to have on Friday something fun. And this is the workshop that is meant to be fun. Uh, so we hope you have fun with it. We're going to have fun with it. But what we wanted to do, there's only two podcasts that we know that are national. Um, and that is the Stormwater World with Ty Garman out of Texas. And then California, you see on the, on the screen behind me, our SWIP radio. So we thought it would be a lot of fun to bring together the two podcasts to do a joint podcast. We're actually going to post both of, both of us are going to post this program, not only on Stormwater Awareness Week, but on our own podcast. So it's going to be a little fun. This is meant to be uh, like a talk radio show. We may get you involved. We have guest, guest uh, panelists involved. So it's meant to be fun. So I thought it'd be fun to start this off as we traditionally would with our own podcast. So Matt, why don't you do the SWIP radio introduction? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of SWIP Radio with WGR Southwest. I am Matt Lewis, your host, and I am here today with John Taraskis and many other industry professionals. All right. Perfect. Perfect. And Ty, how do you start your podcast? Hey, we're back with another episode of the Stormwater World Podcast. Really excited to be here with all of the Stormwater Awareness folks, along with the SWIP Radio team. We're going to talk technology today. So let's get it. Absolutely. And that is it. You nailed it. That's it. So yes, we're talking technology today, Ty. And, um, and, and in particular, how technology plays into the stormwater world. And one of them is what we're doing right now, right? Podcasts. And Ty, I think you've been doing podcasts longer than we have, to be honest. I think you, you, you were the first. Um, oh, uh, I, I don't I, know about the first, but I, I've I've been pretty consistent since yeah. uh, since last year. So yeah. So so tell us a little bit about um, how you have seen podcasts used in the industry to to educate, to communicate. I just think it's a great way. Like uh, conferences have their place, but there's just so much more information that needs to get out to the, not only the industry. Uh, but to the general public. And that's probably the big goal. How do we get the general public to start listening and understand stormwater a little bit um, more in depth from just, uh, you know, the flood mitigation and the flooding standpoint that everybody cares about stormwater when it's getting in their house. Uh, but I think the biggest thing for the podcast is just providing information out there. Um, for instance, I had a, a guy reach out to me on Instagram, young guy that's uh, doing uh, inspections out there in California, and he said he'd been listening to it, is new to the industry, and that it had been really helping him. Uh, he felt like it was helping him uh, get through that learning curve to help him with uh, his inspections and his his new career. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, inspectors are our perfect audience because what are they doing all day? Driving around, right? Right. <laughs> you right. do a lot of driving. Um, yeah. All right. What do you, I mean? You, I mentioned you listen to a few podcasts. Oh, I, I'm late. I was actually, you know, it's funny. I was late to the podcast game. Um, I do listen to some now. I listen to podcasts on how to be a better podcaster, ironically, but hey, uh, 1% better every day, right? And, uh, but I do, I tell you, I've listened to a lot of books on audio and then it was just kind of a natural transition. Yeah. Um, but uh, but this is different, right? Number one, doing doing it live today, and kind of being part of the interview process. I'm usually the one on the other side of the of the microphone, right? Uh, right, like you are. So this is a little different. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm excited to see uh, where we go. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and Matt, um, we've been doing Swift Radio now. This is our second season. Um, tell us a little bit about you know how podcasts have been utilized, how we've utilized it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, probably one of the benefits for just the average QSP out there is they can listen, like Ty said, get informed uh, rather quickly, but they can uh, acquire PDHs. You can get those uh, annual hours that you need as far as training, but also uh, what we've done this season, season two, 
is we've really dove into foundational training and foundational training is something that all QSPs and delegated inspectors are going to need to, to acquire, uh, once the 2022 becomes fully active, uh, next year. And so it's been a really great way for people to access this foundational training, to access information that normally they would have to sit down in a classroom or, or maybe could only access uh, at certain times of the year. And so now it's really at their fingertips 24-7. Right, right. And of course, um, our podcast is more California-centric. Like the first season, we covered the new construction general permit. Uh, we probably threw out some acronyms that only Californians know, like QSPs, Qualified SWIFT Practitioners, and PDHs. Well, most of the country knows what PDHs are, Professional Development Hours. In fact, along those lines, um, EnviroCert, who runs the CPS, uh, CPSWQs, the SESWI, they recently deemed our podcast, uh, I believe also Stormwater World, um, as applicable for PDHs. And so that's really cool. Uh, that, I'm, still, I'm, I'm still under the application process. Oh, you're still there. Well, Swift so Radio, they, if they accept us, they'll accept you. Um, so, yeah, the, the podcasts are very useful. And what we realized is, you know, inspectors, no matter what you call them here in California, they're called QSPs. But no matter uh, what you call them, they have a lot of drive time. They have a lot of behind the wheel. And that's dead time. And if they can knock out some of their continuing education, as Matt said, if they can learn something about the permit that they're about to inspect on uh, or knock out what a new requirement in California to have foundational training for delegated inspectors, then, hey, why not? You know, if you're if, if you're going to listen to something, you might as well listen to that. So um, I think that's been a, a great use of technology. Now, Ty, you've had on some pretty impressive hosts or, or guests, I should say, on your program. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the people you've interviewed and that people can still go listen to? Uh, well, our very own Doug Book, who's on the call with us today, um, he was he was our first episode. So it's always good to get nice to go back to uh, the original episode. But we've had a lot of folks on. Um, and I was just looking at it before we got on today about, you know, as far as technology goes to keep it on theme, right. On what we're talking about today. And, uh, a lot of the different, it's almost seems like every episode, something comes up with technology, but just in the recent few episodes, you know, we just talked to digital site box. I mean, they're disrupting, um, the construction world with creating a, a, a digital version of the site box for store and plans. It's an amazing technology, in my opinion. I've had, um, you know, Gene Norman on with WaterWatch Pro. He's got a great application. Uh, of course, Doug's going to touch on uh, the info tracker and being able to actually prove the amount of information that you can, uh, amount of uh, water that you've, you're infiltrating, uh, which is, you know, it all sounds good until like somebody says, well, prove it. Yeah. And then when you can, that's where the rubber meets the road, in my opinion. So we've had a lot of great, great folks on, um, you know, just again, just recently we were, you know, talked to Andy Erickson from uh, St. Paul's Labs. And he was he was going on and on about smart ponds and how everybody should be looking into, you know, you know, smart make, making their existing or older or original or standard technology a little smarter with the technology that we have available today. So. Yeah, and yeah. people can listen to all of these. Uh, how how do they find your podcast? You can you can listen to the Stormwater World podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can listen to it on the Stormwater World uh, website, um, or you can go to YouTube if you want to look at this ugly mug while you're trying to drive down the road. <laughs> please don't have an accident, but uh, it is on YouTube as well. Yeah, yeah, and Swift Radio is also on Spotify and Apple Podcast, and uh, um, so yeah. Um, so we're talking technology and of course the big buzzword or phrase in technology discussions, no matter what context you're in is AI, right? Everybody's talking about AI. Well, it dawned on me the other day, you know, as I'm, you know, thinking about AI, but in regards to my, our industry, I'm like, wait a minute, am I going to lose my job? You know, I write SWIPs for a living, you know, I write construction SWIPs, industrial SWIPs. You know, is AI going to change all that? 
you know, can somebody write AI now? So I had one of my employees, Dan Bomback. I assigned him. I said, Dan, do you think you could use a chat GPT or an AI uh, to, to write a Swift? And so um, I want to uh, invite him on and, and have him share what, what he came up with. So here's yeah, Dan. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks. So, yeah, what we did was we, uh, we used chat GPT and we just uh, didn't feed it anything. I'm not using a custom <laughs> GPT or anything. I'm just saying like, hey, do you know what a SWIP is? And it's like, yeah, I do. And, and uh, so I'm like, can you help me outline one? And so I'll kind of share my screen and show you what it, uh, what it output, which, you know, I mean, first of all, like a SWIP has to be developed by a QSD. So, you know, it doesn't do like the lay person much good to develop their own, but it kind of, uh, I think it could be used as a valuable tool for a QSD, maybe um, to help streamline some of the process. You could maybe help outline, you know, uh, saying you have to develop something new, like when the 22 permit came out, uh, maybe you use it to help structure, you know, how you want to lay things out. So it it did all of this. This is its um, structure that it, it thinks that things should go in. And then it starts, you know, putting in it some, I fed it a little bit of information just to give it like a site and things like that, but not much, you know? And I found, you know, in reviewing this document, like there are errors all over the place, but it you would never know it unless you're a QSD and you've been trained and you have the expertise to realize this stuff. But, you know, there's just errors right and left that, it confidently says are not errors. And if you ask it, like, uh, are you sure this is, yes, this is exactly what it should, you know, be. Uh, I was looking for the uh, the part here that, it oh, here we go for inspections, you know. Uh, you know, it says a frequency for regular inspections. What, what that means, we're not sure. Uh, once every seven days and within 24 hours after a storm event of 0 0.05 inches or greater. So that, that is not correct. That <laughs> not for California, anyways. Not for California. Yeah. So uh, it it kind of can can get you there, but not really. I mean, this is a a complex document that is very site specific. You know, depending on your location, on your soil types, on your risk level. You know, what kind of a mm -hmm. building this is going to be, what materials are going to be used in the in the process, and to just rely on something like ChatGPT is not going to get you where you want to go. Yeah. That being well, said, you know, there, you know, if you ignore ChatGPT completely or any AI, I think you're going to get left behind eventually, you know, <laughs> so maybe utilize it as a tool, but don't rely on it exclusively. Well, to be fair, I review SWIPs for municipalities, and this actually is better than some of the ones I've seen submitted. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, wow, that's fire. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, Ty, you you have uh, uh, invited to our program today somebody who knows a little bit more than we do about AI. You want to um, introduce that person? I did. I did. And before I, before I do, I think, you know, I think we'd all agree though, that if you were a brand new QSD or QSP and rather than looking at a blank slate, I mean, that, that would be great to have that. Though, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, to, to look at, you know, against versus going back to your textbook. But, uh, but I would like to bring in a gentleman that, uh, I mean, I play around with AI a lot, but this gentleman, he lives it and breathes it. Um, I'm happy to be able to call him a friend of mine. Met him in Dallas not too long ago uh, at an event that we were both at. And uh, when we were there, he has a free Facebook group for people that want to learn more about AI and how to be a better prompter in AI, because that's a very big key. And I think he'll probably touch on that. When we were there, it had 36,000 people in that Facebook group. I think wow. now it's over 200,000 people as of today. So uh, please uh, help me welcome. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jonathan Mast from White Beard Strategies. Jonathan, thanks for being on the pod with us today. We're on the Stormwater Awareness Week uh, workshop. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for the invite, Ty. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here and excited to talk about AI. You know, it's uh, I think it's interesting is obviously I'm coming in without 
knowing stormwater plans and all that type of stuff and taking a look at this. AI can do a lot to help us, but I think it's important to remember, uh, and saying this as an expert, it's not a magic bullet. It's not a silver bullet to get all of this done. It will amplify existing skill and talent, but it's not, as we saw in that, that sample that Dan brought up, it's not necessarily going to get everything perfect out of the box. Right. So, so it's, I, I don't have to worry about my job quite yet. My guess is in, in not in any time that's going to matter in the next few decades. Again, and the reason I say that is, is that AI is really smart. It, it's it's like got immediate recall. It's got tons of data. If you go to, you know, Perplexity, which is my favorite AI search engine, and ask what is a stormwater protection plan, it, it will tell you in great detail. That's what I did when Ty invited me here. I'm like, what is this? I got to find out about this. And it understands it and it has great detail. But as Dan pointed out in, in the example that he gave, just because it understands what it is doesn't mean that it's capable of writing it effectively. And I think, could we get closer than Dan got? Dan, no, no uh, slight whatsoever. But if we put more time into it, I think we could. I think the key here, though, is, you know, John, if you if you put more time into it or Dan put more time into understand this, there's a good probability we could get you 90 percent of the way there. But I don't think we're at a point where we're going to get you 100% of the way there. And part of that is, is we need to custom train the AI models that we're going to use. There's a lot of different models, but we would need to custom train that. Um, you know, Tide said, Jonathan, if you want to share your screen, you can. I'd be happy to, but I don't know there's a lot to show you only because of the fact that in order to do this effectively, because we're talking about so many details and so many regulations, is we need to upload all of that data to the AI model so that it knows what to reference. And then we've got to give it specific instructions on what to reference. And then we need to remember it's a lot like any other member of our team. It will occasionally make mistakes. Um, and if you go, well, why is it going to make mistakes? Part of that's because I'm sure even in the stormwater protection world, there are guides that are on opposite ends of the spectrum as to what might be acceptable. And guess what? It got trained on both of those. But nobody told it which one was right. Or we have states that have different laws. California is going to be different possibly than Michigan, where I'm at today. As a result, it gets confused sometimes between what it needs to do and what it does. Does that mean it's not useful? No, it can be incredibly useful. But it needs to be guided by somebody with that skill and experience. And, you know, John and Dan, in your cases, it could probably cut the creation or the review process in half or less. But it doesn't mean we're going to go from something that takes a week to prepare to something that takes seven minutes to prepare. Yeah. Right? Does that does that all make sense? Absolutely. And and if I hear you right, it it is a tool. It's not it's something that is that I can just hit a button and it's going to do my job for me. But it might not help me to do my job faster and exactly. more efficiently. And, and potentially even better. And, and if I can do it faster and more efficiently and better, that means my prices might drop. Or if I'm not using AI to do it faster or better or more efficiently, I might actually find myself priced out of the market. In other words, think, if, if the going rate right now for a construction SWIP is $2,500, using AI maybe five years down the road or maybe not even that, it could be two hundred and fifty dollars. Is that what is that a correct assessment? I, I think it's correct. I'm not sure I would agree that it's probably going to drop that dramatically in price. Uh, it reminds me of a story of you know a shipbuilder that was having a problem with the engines, and they no matter what they tried to do, they couldn't figure out how to get the engines to work. So somebody finally thought and said, we need to call Gary. Gary worked here for 40 years. He just retired two months ago. Let's call Gary. Gary can fix it. And Gary shows up and he has coffee with the guys and he chats and everything else. And they go, can Gary, can you get around to fixing the, the engine on the ship here? Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. You got a, You got a hammer? Yeah, here's a hammer. And Gary disappears behind the back of the engine and they hear a bang. And they hear another bang. All of a sudden, the engine takes off and starts running. They're like, Gary, man, you are amazing. I don't know how you did it. He's, ah, don't worry, I've been here a long time. And they said, send us a bill. So Gary sends them a bill for $10,000. And they go, Gary, you were here for five minutes well maybe 20 but we spent 15 drinking coffee and gary says <laughs> yes but it's you know 50 dollars for the time i was there it's nine thousand nine hundred and fifty for knowing where to hit the engine yeah 
And I think that it absolutely applies in this and so many other fields with AI. Again, it's a tool that amplifies skill and experience. Do I think you may see that your competitors may drop some prices? Absolutely, that may happen in the future. And I think that's a great reason to get in. But I also think that more likely we're going to be able to cut down on on rework we're going to be able to cut down on the amount of time and effort it takes and we're going to be able to be more efficient so now instead of maybe having the capacity to write and i have no idea if i'm right here but one plan per week now maybe i could write three a week or four a week and do an even better job than i did prior and so even if we cut the prices by 25 percent, which i think is more realistic than 90 percent everybody wins. The customer wins, they get a better value. We win as a company and the employees because they're able to drive more value ultimately win as well because they come, become that much more valuable to the organization and to the customers. All right. Well, good. Hey, you know, this is a live podcast. Uh, we, we have a live audience. Does anyone have a comment? Unmute yourself if you'd like to, to, to comment either. Maybe you tried AI out. Uh, maybe you have um, some unique experience with AI. Let us know. Uh, you can either put it in the chat or raise your hand or shoot, just uh, just unmute and uh, well, let us know. While we're waiting, while we're waiting on that, Jonathan, can you can you share with everybody? I think this would be very valuable for everyone. I know it was for me. Can you just give everybody like your 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 tips on prompting or not? I don't know. If Absolutely. Have time to go over your full prompting framework, but definitely it, the it tips won't take long. That, Right, exactly. So that would be very valuable, I think, for those that I think a lot of people stick their toe in AI and they get a weird result and then they just go, oh, this doesn't work. And that's just not true. Yeah, I'll try to do this in 30 seconds or less. So remember, when we're communicating with AI, they call that prompting. Don't be confused. It's prompt engineering. It's just a big word. It just means we're talking. If you texted somebody today, you've done the same thing. But you need to give it context. If Ty, if you and I are working on a project and I walk down the hall and I say to you, hey, go ahead and write this report for me. And I turn around and walk away and you go, hey, you got a question. I go, no, 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 I don't have time. Chances are that report's not going to be very good because I didn't give you any information. And AI does the same thing. When we go to AI and we don't give it any background, any context, it sucks, guys. It's not going to give you good information. But there's four simple steps. I'll go through them really quick. One, AI is broad. You need to tell it what type of expert to act as. So you're an expert at writing these reports. Step one. Number two, you need to give it context. I'm writing a report in this state, in this municipality. Here are the relevant laws and restrictions that you need to reference in order to do that. And then three, ask it your question. I need you to write the report, or in this case, probably we need to start with an outline of the report, and then we need to write each section. It's not going to write the entire report in one prompt. And the last is the most important. Don't forget ask me any questions you have before you give me your best possible response. Because if you're like me, you forget to give it relevant information all the time. I do that with my assistant. I do that with my wife. I do that with my kids. I forget to give them relevant information because it's up here. So I assume everybody knows. Hey, I can't read your mind. So always ask it at the end of your prompts. Please ask me any questions you have. And it will then ask you what it needs to give you an amazing response. Wow. Wow. Very well said. Hey, I see. think I see Ranger unmuted. Ranger, did you have a comment? I do have a comment. Uh, for one, this has been very entertaining and uh, and lots of fun uh, as well. And I think that's a, a critical element to have people come to your blog is that you're all having fun. And clearly, uh, Ty, you and John are doing that very thing. I used uh, AI for my presentation, which was at 9 o'clock this morning with Roger Sutherland. And... Uh, what, what I asked it was something I uh, had wondered about, which is uh, sweepers all fill up with water at the start of the shift, some amount of water. They spray it out for dust suppression. So you're taking all this perfectly good water and turning it into a PM10 slurry and, and uh, trundling it off to, the, to some dump site and, and dumping it out. So how much water are we actually losing in AI? And I use perplexity because... It, uh, you, it licenses chat and then adds uh, more current information. But it estimated, and I can't tell you the accuracy of this, but I used it. 20,000 sweepers out there sweeping every day. They're going to use about an average of 150 gallons a piece. Turns out that's real near 3 million gallons of water a day that uh, AI is telling me sweepers uh, are fouling. And we've got to change that. That's one of the things I've pushing for our sweepers in our industry. 
Yeah. So thanks again, gents. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, we want to now move on to our next area of technology. And Matt, this is something you know about. So Matt, why don't you why don't you kick us off here? Um, you do a lot of inspections. So tell us how you use technology. That's right. We uh, at WGR have developed uh, what we call an inspection app, and it is just a sort of carbon copy of the paper app that you would probably find in most SWIPs or at least most older SWIPs. But we have on today Amy Grove, sales and market representative with Cloud Comply, who supposedly has the most epic stormwater inspection <laughs> app technology <laughs> around. So Amy, oh, why don't you take awesome. it away? Yeah, I'd just like to say how awesome that is that I'm not the only one that likes to give you a hard time, Amy. So that was fan that was the best introduction ever. No, pr no, pr no pressure. Yeah, no pressure at all. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone, for having me on. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time talking about just the importance of bringing the inspection process from pen and paper, Excel spreadsheets, or Fillable PDFs into a, a more web-based and, and cloud-based or mobile app or, or um, just a digital way of doing it, whichever way works best. But let's get off of those pen and paper. Um, I have... I was at a conference and I, a, a city employee came up to me and I said, Hey, how are you handling your inspection process and keeping track of everything? And he brought out, I'm not even kidding. He brought out a manila folder, this big of paper documents and saying, Hey, these are all the inspections I did this week and I need to input them. And I was thinking, Oh my gosh, like, <laughs> what are you doing walking around the conference? Like, you got to get that stuff in there. He's like, so it's stuff like that. You know, we should be doing that real time. We shouldn't be, um, spending time writing everything out and then re-inputting it in, scanning and all of that type of stuff. Your your time, every inspector's time is worth more than that. Your time should be spent doing more inspections, um, checking on compliance and that sort of thing and not the admin stuff. So once again, we're talking about technology being a tool and not replacing your job. And that's what the any of the softwares out there are doing. They're a tool for just making that inspection process a whole lot uh, more streamlined, incorporating the photos, getting the finished inspection reports out in the hands of the key stakeholders. And at the end of the day, the faster that they have those um, action items in their hands, um, have visibility over it, the managers have visibility over it, the more in compliance that everyone can be, right? And we're all about stormwater awareness. And so we're just really trying to, to stay in compliance and reduce all of that, um, you know, pollution prevention and all of that. So um, I'll share my screen and just show a real quick view of the, what the, the stormwater inspection in action. So let's see here. Okay. Famous question. Everyone can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So, yeah. So, with Cloud Comply, which is a cloud based um, software, um, web app, and mobile app, offline capabilities, because you want to be able to have easy access in the field to start to finish, do your inspections, regardless of connectivity. Um, and you want to be able to, to have the right inspection form and to just get in and out, do your inspection, add the photos. So, I'm going to just jump to a, a site that yep. it would help if you know spelling mistakes happens um and then i can go ahead and that will take me into a construction site and i can go ahead and just do the inspection so first things first with digital with anything digital now everything's all at your fingertips um you don't have to be carrying around as uh the stormwater the last stormwater inspection, you don't have to grab, have the the SWIP plan, the site map, all of that stuff in a, in a folder with you and on your binder. It's all right here. You have access to it. And then you can just go in and you can hit create inspection um, and just do your inspection process. So once again, you know, I am showing cloud comply. Um, I'm biased, so I'm showing that, but there's a, there's a lot of softwares. There's a lot of technology out there. So it's just really about, I'm an advocate for as is Ty, as is all of everyone um, using technology as a tool. So anything that you're looking at, 
you should want to have the ability to pre-fill um, site details so that everything is consistent. And it, once again, we're eliminating redundant data entry. So that should be a, a key thing in making things more efficient and effective. Um, so for example, you're seeing here, all of the, the time and dates comes in automatically, project name, permit information. Um, you should be able to have custom inspection forms that are specific to the state or um, permit that you're under. So I happen, this one happens to be more California centric, um, old California centric, because you got just some post storms during storms um, in here. Um, so all of that should be all as automated as possible, signature capabilities. And then weather integration is usually key with stormwater, especially with construction. Um, so having those integrations is key too. So just things to keep in mind when you're thinking about what type of digital uh, solutions that you're wanting to implement, whether it's something that is already out there or something that you create. Um, Pre-filling from previous inspections, right? Uh, inspection is compliance at a specific point in time, but it's important to see what's changed from week to week or inspection to inspection, compliance issues to roll forward. So that's um, that's super key as well. So this is pulling forward some of the general comments I said the last time. And I've got a checklist here. So this should be the checklist that you guys are going down, um, matching whatever checklist is pertinent to that site, that permit, and the ab ability to easily answer questions, um, see deficiencies or corrective actions from the last time. Um, so this is what this is showing right here. Um, so, and then also being able to add photos is, is really key as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and add a, an action item while I'm scrolling down and trying to find the right one. Uh, is there any, Ty, is there any questions? Ty actually knows this a lot better than I do. No, um, so. uh, I, I don't know about that. I don't know that about that anymore. I, uh. I, I think it it's awesome. Dear, it, it is near and dear to my heart. So <laughs> I think it's awesome how you how it um auto fills the previous deficiencies that I wish our app actually had that. That would be really helpful to track that. that that's yes, a really nice feature. Yeah, definitely. Like because a lot of times, right? Um, you're probably having to look at like whatever the last inspection or even having that as a reference. So yeah, definitely pre-filling. Um, and another, the, the deficiency component is one of the most important parts, right? Like identifying compliance issues and ensuring that they're getting resolved in a timely manner. So another key thing that um, I think is what I really like about within our software is um, you can, of course, type out what the deficiency is. So if I say like stockpile not properly uh, maintained, let's just go with that. We have predefined list of corrective actions and it's completely defined by the client, whatever, you know, company, city or anything. So if you are saying the same thing over and over again, hey, like rekey those silk fence or, you know, make sure that stockpiles are properly covered and dust pollution, all of that type of stuff. You can have that already set. So you're not typing out the same thing over and over again. So going back to you know, cutting down the time. It's a tool to cut down the time that you're spent on, on doing some of these things. Are you, in, are you implying that our contractors do not get right on it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah we, 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 we tend to repeat ourselves quite a bit, don't we, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I hear that from every inspector for sure. So it's nice to be able to, to just have that right out um, right away. And then the other thing that's key is obviously being able to set the, if you're standing over the deficiency, set it to your current location. If you send the deficiency out to the contractor or a subcontractor, they can have the map view of exactly where that deficiency is. Because I know a lot of times they might say that they, you know, that wasn't made clear to them what they needed to fix. Um, so it, the pictures plus mapping is really key. So having that be incorporated. Um, so Speaking about photos, I'm on my web browser right now, so it's going to open up my files. But if I was on my mobile 
device, a uh, tablet, phone, this would allow me to take a picture right then and there. Um, I often hear a lot of people take a bunch of photos then they have to go back and resize them. Remember which site you're going to 12, 15 sites, possibly remember which site those photos were associated with. So just incorporating the photos right away is really key. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another another thing to, to think about when you're looking at a tool um, to make your We've, inspection uh... process. We've got a question in the chat. Yes. One of our MS4 guys here at WGR, he's asking if cloud comply can be used to conduct industrial general permit and or phase two MS4 uh, inspections. Yes, to all of that. So um, cloud comply specifically is configured um, for any CGP, um, industrial, MSGP, and um, MS4, we have both phase one and phase two cities that utilize us. It's highly configurable, so different workflows are turned on and the inspection forms are customized to the specific um, cities um, and also, or permit requirements, and also enforcements can be incorporated as well for those, for the municipalities and public education outreach, all of the minimum control measures. Right, and uh, Mel, Mel also brings up a good point and says that autofilling those previous deficiencies is technically a requirement under the new CGP here in California. And uh, uh, due, and due to photos of deficiencies being required. And then she, she also talks about that the new Caltrans form uh, addresses that and that they're working with you guys to develop those forms. Yes, yes, yes. Caltrans forms, um, for sure, they're very, very complex and, and they require a lot of, um, you know, you have to make sure that you're very exact with the language and, and staying up to date with all the permit requirements. Um, another requirement that's becoming more and more popular is making sure that the, the, the deficiencies get in the hands of the key stakeholders within, uh, I believe in, in California, it's 48 or 48 hours or 72 hours um, and ensuring that they have all everything, all the information in order to actually resolve it. So being able to send out the deficiencies aside, just like to a subcontractor or to the key stakeholder um, away from just doing the inspection report. So that's another thing. Um, tool that we now have is the ability to send out the individual deficiencies. So a subcontractor, for example, or the consultant, you can send it to a subcontractor if, if it's that responsibility. And you could just type in the email right here. Now, I, I've been hearing some, some inspection softwares are actually geolocating now. So they will actually know where you're at, that you are at that site, um, either through the photo or through just your GPS coordinates. Is that something that you guys have built into yours? Yes. So you can have GPS coordinates be set um, for when you're identifying a deficiency, but also just at the inspection level. And also coordinates can be put time and date and coordinate stamps can be put onto the photo itself. So the moment you step on the site, the app already knows. Yep, exactly. <laughs> All right. And time in, time out, because time tracking is a is a newer requirement in some of these MS4 permits. Um, they're having to track more and more time. And so we incorporated a time component as well, making sure the time in, time out, and the total time spent on an inspection or an investigation, that sort of thing. Nice. Nice. Cloud oh. comply is definitely epic. I wasn't fooling around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got just another minute uh, on this topic. Anyone have a question for Amy? Maybe you, you got a testimonial. Maybe use Cloud Comply. Um, feel free to unmute or, or put it in the chat, but we'd love to hear from our audience. Well, uh, I've got a comment. I'd say, you know, training, training and support is big on any piece of software that you purchase. And so I sold software, ran a software compliance company for the last 13 years. Amy and I used to actually be uh, competitors with each other, but uh, I tend to make frenemies uh, because I think there's plenty of uh, plenty to go around. And uh, I just like to say that, um, you know, that's something you sometimes you don't think about. And they do have, I, I know Amy, I know Jason and their team there, and they do have a good training and support uh, capabilities, which is, you know, everything looks fine. It looks nice and shiny and that sounds good uh, until it's actually effective for you out in the field, right? You got to shore up that gap and their team will help you um, get out there and get to a fast start with their, with their, uh, with their software. So. 
All right. Well, thank you, Amy. Yeah, that's, that is awesome. Uh, we're moving on, though, talking about technology still, but uh, technology can also help us measure our performance uh, as far as what, what things are doing, whether it is um, using a turbidity meter to know, are we getting turbidity down or is pH where it should be? Um, it, it is also used to, to measure rainfall. This morning, if you're interested to see another uh, aspect of technology that we're really not going to go much into this one, uh, the city of Raleigh had a presentation that was wonderful. In fact, pretty cool. Hurricane Helene was moving through the area and uh, they were showing how they're using technology to get ready for that, literally to save lives. Uh, but uh, Ty, let's talk a little bit about the use of technology when it comes to measuring performance, maybe uh, how our low impact development is doing. Um, you have a guest that you've invited <laughs> to speak to that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I, I, I do. And uh, I tell you, I, I would just rather not take up any of his time because you said you wanted this to be fun. Right. And we talked pre-call. We were setting this all up. You're like fun, stormwater. Oh, my gosh. It just limits. I mean, sorry, everybody. It just <laughs> limits. That's such a small circle. But then it immediately hit me. Oh, you want fun and you want stormwater. Well, then we got to we got to call Doug Book with pave drain so um <laughs> doug no other further introduction everybody knows who you are anyway so uh you want to um tell us a little bit about uh pave drain and the ability to actually prove the amount of water that you're mitigating through technology i would love to i just wish i had as silky as john lewis there that my nasally upper Midwest thing doesn't sound as good as those <laughs> guys that have silky smooth voices. Yeah. So, but, he, does, uh, he does sound good through that microphone. Man, <laughs> that guy, I really want to grab that thing. I'm hoping if I grow out a beard like Jonathan that I could uh, talk like that, my voice would sound that good, but I don't think that's it. I don't think so. Hey, I don't think, I don't think that's going to work. So, uh -huh. uh, yeah, can I, uh, let's uh, jump over to see my, can everybody see my screen now as it becomes the question. We'll give you a second. So while you're doing that, so uh, Doug, with Pave Drain, if you're not familiar with Pave Drain, it is a permeable paving system. Um, and to go in, to enhance it, he also has the ability to track the data um, and track the amount of water that goes through it. But it looks like that's coming up. You got a little block over there on the right. It started to go away. That's probably your chat or something with the uh, Zoom. Oh, there it is. Nope. But as I was saying, the infill tracker is a device that can go and retrofit into a paved drain um, uh, project, and it literally will show you how much uh, water has been uh, infiltrated through the system uh, in real time um you know what doug we can see the screen okay yeah. so just you don't it. need to go yeah. in presentation just click on let's the slide just, you want to show let's just, let's just show this one so here's what yeah. really was going on yeah. we were involved with go all ahead. these projects all around the country and a lot of people do they really know what their stormwater products are doing uh do, do they really know how much stormwater that rain garden is infiltrating do they really know what that pond is doing kind of my my uh, thing that I like to like to beat on the most is: Do you really know what these ponds are getting are do are are doing for you? Are you getting the bang for the buck, so to speak? And so uh, we were involved with project after project around the country. We have uh, approaching six million square foot of paved drain installed around the country. And what started happening was we were at more and more bigger storm events. I think nobody's going to argue against that. More intense storm events were happening. And every time it would happen, we'd have engineers and some municipalities that we had very good relationships with to come back and say, you know, that we just had a two and a half inch rain event and the stormwater product that we put in, uh, it should have it should have flooded out based on the math and the modeling that was going on. And over and over again, it, would ha it just wouldn't happen. They were the what we were doing was just taking on more and more stormwater. And what was going on was uh, even after maintenance and everything, the real question became. How much stormwater are we really capturing? Are we overbuilding everything? Are we underbuilding everything uh, by the engineering community? How much money is being spent? And what ended up happening was we got together with uh, 
uh, three guys from uh, Marquette University, three RSGs, as I call them, really smart guys. <laughs> and they all got PhDs and all these other small and big numbers after their after their names. And they're brilliant. And uh, we sat down with them and drew up on a whiteboard that said, hey, here's what I want to do. I want to be able to go into an existing paved drain project, remove the blocks, drive something down in between that open graded aggregate and with a float valve on it and see just how fast, how much stormwater we are capturing in these clay soils and also see how long it is taking these clay soils to infiltrate the water because clay, they say it never infiltrates, but somehow it does. And so what is really going on underneath these systems? So these RSGs from, uh, info, from uh, uh, P4 infrastructure drew this up on a whiteboard and about 10 days later, they had a working model. We went out into an existing project in Cudahy, Wisconsin, took out the blocks, drove down the stainless, perforated stainless steel pipe down in with a float valve, put on a solar panel uh, battery onto a, the shape of one of our paved drain blocks, and lo and behold, it sent a, a signal up to a miner up on a roof, and that then sent a signal right to their uh, computer desk, and it showed just how much stormwater we were capturing on a storm-by-storm -storm basis. Wow. All within about nine months, we did all of this. So amazing, that type of technology tends to spread around a little bit. And what was really going on then on top of it was, man, is it cool to document how often we are, how much stormwater we are capturing. We've got to tell our constituents, look at what we just did. But then the other thing that started coming up was comparing storm events to each other in terms of just how often do we need to do maintenance? Because one of the analogies I like to say is, does anybody ever change a light bulb if it, it needs to be changed? Uh, no. Why go out and just maintain this system? Because, well, it says on this piece of paper over here that I got to do this four times a year at an average cost of uh, $1,500 a, a time. But what happens if it doesn't need it? So what this was able to do is compare storm events to each other and, and go out and say, well, it visually, I would think as a professional in this that this might need to be cleaned. But the reality is the technology is telling us it doesn't need to be cleaned, which has really been fascinating because as we kept going on and going into more and more projects, we started figuring out that most of these jobs just did not need to be maintained. And very cool technology to be able to understand with and, and compare storm events in terms of how fast is this clay actually taking on the water? Because as everybody says, clay doesn't infiltrate. Yeah, project after project we are on, once that clay starts absorbing water, it starts to absorb more and more water. You just got to have the cross-section built correctly with a uh, proper geotextile, proper rock, and the proper product that gets the water into the ground. Hashtag get it in the ground. So that's kind of what we've been able to do around the country. We've been one of our <laughs> biggest projects. Uh, one's in uh, Illinois. The other one's in, in Wisconsin, another uh, big one is in Maryland at the uh, inside uh, Chesapeake Bay. And the results that they have gotten have far exceeded any model that was out there. It's been a very kind of a big eye-opening situation for the for the both the municipality and the governing agencies involved with this that, hey, maybe we're not doing this the correct way and we need to just get more water in the ground. Yeah. There's that's amazing. Um, so, so you you can measure um, each storm, or do you measure it over a period of time? Both. Wow. We uh, we what's neat is when you when you go in and you start talking with a with a, a the uh, I think we do. Gallons. Okay. So you got to talk about how many gallons of stormwater we have captured, and when you start talking about millions of gallons of stormwater capture. That's an eye opener. Yeah. Uh, earlier this week, we had um, someone showing maintenance on these paver blocks. Uh, they're a group out of uh, Colorado. They do stormwater maintenance, uh, basically. Uh, I think it was sustainable runoff. So they did a whole workshop just on maintaining them and the difference that it makes. Uh, you, you can watch that, that video has been recorded, but uh, I, Imagine part of this tool is also to demonstrate that, okay, here's before maintenance, here's after maintenance, here's why your money just paid off. Correct. And maximize that maintenance dollars. Name a, name a municipality out there that just wants to spend money on maintenance. Everybody hates it anyway. Everybody's going to kick it down, the, kick that can down the road as far as they can. Why not maximize it 
and and document it and say, well, here's what it's been doing. Hard to hey, document. Doug. Hey, yep. Doug, we've got a we've got a question from Mel G. She says, uh, could could you hook up the optional overflow to a dry well or a dry well is not allowed in your area? I don't think many states like dry wells, unfortunately. You yeah, have a don't. comment on that? Yep, a lot of don't. But uh, yes, it could be. You could you could bypass all that. All right. Well, thank thank you, Doug. Uh, um, so, if people want to get a hold of you or or learn more about this, you got a website. We sure do. Uh, right here, Pave Drain. Uh, www.pavedrain.com. Uh, info at pavedrain.com also get you get yeah. you to us, and we will dial you in. In fact, and, do me a do me a favor. Type that in to your uh, into the chat. Same with you, Amy. I forgot to uh, ask you to do that. And Jonathan, if you want to also put your contact information in the chat, that would be awesome. But yeah, thank you, Doug. That's 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 really cool stuff. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Um, so so Ty, let's let's talk. And we got all our guests here, so we can um, we can uh, bring people in as 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 they want to come in. Um, but just to wrap this up, this has been a fun hour. Uh, we've had a lot of fun just kidding with each other and. And uh, I, I see you have new new letters behind your name. Uh, I, so, yeah, uh, I saw that. I saw that. So, uh, but that. but it's been you know, uh, as stormwater professionals, we like letters, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, it's been a fun hour uh, learning about technology, looking at technology. I think uh, we are definitely seeing technology change our our livelihoods, especially in the stormwater industry. But let's talk a little bit about the future. Where is this going? You've talked to a lot of smart people. You've had a lot of guests on your on your show. You know, we got a lot of people even on this show. Um, where is this going? Where do you think we'll be five years, 10 years, 20 years from now uh, when it comes to technology uh, in the stormwater industry? Well, I mean, I think everybody on here knows that the stormwater industry, you know, it's like pushing a rope for the most part. It's a little bit slow. Right. And uh, I've been, you know, I've been involved for 12, 13 years. And while I talk to people sometimes and they get me a little pumped up, like, yeah, we've made it. We've made we're making progress. There's a lot of days where I just, I'm just like, really? Are, are we making progress as I walk around my neighborhood and I've got grass clippings all on the street because we, we still haven't figured out how to get the simple of a, simplest of information uh, out to the, the public and to the people cutting their grass, just, you know, just the simple stuff. Right. But what I think technology does is, is it speeds everything up and hopefully, you know, we will hit a bell curve in this industry and that it's going to make a difference across the board. Um, it'll help, you know, with people not, uh, or, or, or firms not necessarily doing the same old same old and looking for different ways to to uh, attack projects uh, and try to embrace some of these technologies, um, which is a whole nother episode of a, probably we could talk for hours just on just on that right. But uh, none of this stuff is going away. AI is not coming to kill you. It doesn't have thumbs, uh, and uh, you know I think we should all just embrace whatever we can and don't just do it because that's how it's always been done. Right, right. Right. Um, you know, if there's a better way, let's try to figure it out. And then, you know, like what Doug's doing, you know, can you prove it? Right. Yeah. That's a scary I think and I think that's a scary thing for a lot of uh technology out there. Right. It sounds good, looks good in the lab, maybe it passes a few testing, but how does it actually perform out in the field in real in the real world? Right. And how long will it perform? And right. can you prove it? Because if you can prove it, now you can provide transparency to us, the taxpayers, right? How about that? So, yeah, yeah. And Matt, <laughs> <That> was... <laughs> Matt, I want to, I want to hear from you, Matt. Um, you do a lot of inspections. If, if you could all of a sudden become the inventor to create the magic black box to make your job easier, what, what would you want to see happen in, in, when, in the inspection world as far as it comes to inspecting sites and helping to assure that compliance is occurring? Well, I may be a little hesitant to say, but uh, sometimes the hardest part about being a QSP is being on the road so much is uh, dinking around from site to site. I was actually just thinking today about how nice it would be 
to fly a drone. I was just in Madeira yesterday, and Madeira is always the site that I wait to the very end of the month because it's a five, six hour round trip driving. And then I have like, you know, a dozen sites, uh, a, do a dozen different projects to hit on that site. And I was thinking, because we had a, I think we had a, a talk on drone inspections recently this week. And I was thinking, how nice would it be to be in my living room, flying a drone, <laughs> 200 miles away <laughs> oh man so, i thought you were gonna just get to, you're gonna talk about being in the truck you're you're not even gonna do the drive i'm, I'm not you. even gonna it. do the drive i love it yeah now uh you know so but i was thinking of the site of madera is very large how nice it would be because usually even when we take the drone down there i have to drive you know because the drone has a limited uh, ability as far as flying, unless you have a really, you know, super, super nice drone. And so I was like, Oh, it'd be nice if I could just be on site and hit all of my inspections through the drone. Probably some of the guys on site would be a little freaked out if they see a drone flying by taking a picture of a concrete washout or a porta potty, yeah. they walk out of the porta potty and all of a sudden there's a <laughs> drone flying above it. But, yeah. uh, I you won't know, say I think... what, what I, I won't say what would happen to your drone <laughs> here in Texas. But... Yeah, so <laughs> I do like um, like listening to Amy. I love the way that um, Cloud Comply the app is set up, and it's it's sort of reduces that redundancy. So I guess if I were to just close in short, if if there is a lot of redundant things that we do out in the field, and that's what I think would be nice because sometimes this job can get sort of boring and monotonous. And I think that's when mistakes can be made when I'm sort of irritated at, at looking at the 50th washout or porta potty or fiber roll or whatever. <laughs> and I might just want to blast through an inspection faster than I should, you know, if we can reduce some of that monotony. And that redundancy, right. uh, I think it'll make me a better inspector and keep me more engaged. Right, right. Well, thanks. And um, what I want to talk to as far as the future is education. And that's, I agree with you, Ty. In many areas, the stormwater industry has been slow to embrace change. But I think in the area of education, um, our industry has actually been maybe on the cutting edge of, of much of this. We're starting to see organizations, especially municipalities, using social media to a very large extent now. Um, take this event, Stormwater Awareness Week. This has been amazing. Um, we never, ever predicted what would happen with this event um, 12 years ago. In fact, you featured us on your podcast, so if people want to hear the history, uh, they can just go to your podcast and listen to it. You, you interviewed uh, uh, my key coordinator, Rebecca Burnett, and and I got to say a couple of things on there, too, about the event. But it literally started as a small little Central Valley thing in California to now. This year, we had um, registrations for all these workshops added up to uh, more than 10,670 registrations with uh, unique individuals, more than 2,500 unique individuals coming from 49 of the 50 states. I asked uh, Rebecca, I said, which state wasn't represented? They said, as far as we can tell, North Dakota. <laughs> uh, but uh, we had 23 countries, people uh, attending these workshops from 23 countries wow. and two U.S. territories. And, you know, we're not the only ones doing it. So there's others that are, are using these platforms to get the word out to um, about education. Again, that, that Raleigh one, the North Carolina, so impressed me what they were doing with education and how they were getting their public involved was amazing. So I'm hoping that our technology, the use of technology when it comes to communication just, just keeps increasing. And we see Stormwater Awareness Week and other events like this um, just continue to grow and develop and use new aspects and do crazy podcasts like this. So I want to thank all of you for being a part of this. This has been a fun hour. It's been a blast. You will hear it on SWIP Radio. You'll hear it on Stormwater Awareness. Uh, I'm sorry, the Stormwater World podcast. And you will hear it on Stormwater Awareness Week. It'll be posted there. 
But thank you to all of you who attended. Thank you for our guest speakers today. Thank you. And, uh, thank you very much. We got a couple more left this afternoon, but Stormwater Awareness Week 2024 is almost in the can. So thank you to all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, John, for putting us all together. Appreciate it. Thank all you right. Thank you very much for everybody being here.